It's the Bulls Podcast, Episode 50. Hey, Chicago Bulls fans, it's time for your Bulls Podcast. Here are your hosts, Marcus Couch and Wise Black. Welcome to the Bulls Podcast, coming to you from BullsPodcast.com. This is where we bring you the latest news, reviews, rants, rumors, and opinions on the players, coaches, and front office of the Chicago Bulls. My name is Marcus Couch, and with me is my co-host, Mr. Wise Black. What's up, Marcus? What's going on with my bull life is out there, man. Today's show was a very, very special one. So, I mean, it is really going to speak for itself. Absolutely. So, what we've got for you all is a gift. It's the holiday week, so we decided we'd give you all a gift. And what we're going to present to you is an exclusive Bulls podcast interview with the now retired Tommy Edwards. And Tommy was a longtime Bulls announcer and just up until November was even the Bulls announcer and the PA for this season. So I asked Tommy a lot of interesting questions and he even divulged some NBA secrets that I've not even heard ever. So this Mm -hmm. is a special interview, and it goes for almost an hour. And Wise, I would be willing to put a very sizable bet down that this is probably the longest Tommy Edwards interview in history. It's great that we could get him this fresh off of you know retirement, literally just not even a month off of retirement. And I'm I'm really thrilled that we get to bring this to the Bulls podcast listeners. This is awesome. But before we get into that, man, it's been 50 episodes wise. I mean, we have done so much with this show. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It seems like, you know, I, I listened just the other day to some of the first episodes. And even though our format is relatively the same, um, we've, you and I have grown in, in terms of chemistry, in terms of, you know, friendship uh, amongst you and I and dealing with the bulls and, and just our, our overall persona of the podcast. We've been guests on other podcasts that are out there and thus far, man, it's been a great experience for me. How about you? (laughs) Yeah, man. I mean, I can't say enough in terms of my experience with you, uh, doing this bulls podcast, man, this has been quite, uh, long it feels like it's been such a long time but truthfully it 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 really hasn't you know what i mean i think what this is our second year you know so for how far there you go for how far i I really plan for us to go man i still feel like we're really just getting started and yeah I, i feel the same way uh in regards to our chemistry and just us growing overall together within this podcast and i think a lot of the uh listeners they they hear it too they see it as well so man, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm just super excited to continue, man. And it, by this being episode 50, it just really shows that we have that stickability and and longevity with this, man. Absolutely. And and we got some other things planned down the road. You know, we'd obviously like to get a sponsor and get some things going on. And uh, this is, you know, the the shows like this, these kinds of interviews and these things that we bring to you guys, the the Bulls fans out there. Um, I I think that brings us one step closer. And wise, uh, I don't want to let the secret or the cat out of the bag just yet. But mm-hmm. in uh, three, four episodes from now, we got a biggie coming up, a big one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, keep it on the low. Keep it on the low. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to that next year. Looking forward to that. That's going to be great. So, without further delay, I'm going to give you the interview with Tommy Edwards. And now, wise, here it is. The one thing I think a lot of people don't know or Bulls fans don't know is that when you started announcing and that's about the time you started right when artist Gilmore and those guys were on the, in the lineup, right? That's the first year that uh, the ABA and the NBA merged. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know that the announcer actually was center court during those introductions. And Uh, yeah, well that, uh, I guess when I started, I I don't think I was ever, the only time I was out on the court at center is the first time I left the Bulls. And that was in 1990. My last game was with, uh, let's see, it was against the Phoenix Suns. 
Cotton Fitzsimmons was the coach of the Suns at the time. And they wanted me to do the the thing standing out at midcourt. And then mm. all of the players, you know, Michael and Scottie Pippen and, and all those guys came out and did a, uh, shook hands and wished me well and all that stuff, which was really great. But most of the other times I'm sitting right there at the table at center. Court. Yeah. So, I mean, you have pro- that, that is probably one of the most interesting gigs I would say in all of sports because First off, I don't know how you have the mental, I guess, uh, quickness or sharpness to be able to follow that game completely as it is in front of you and and announce things that happen within split seconds. I mean, how did you hone that in terms of being able to watch the game, disseminate what's going on and, and get everything correct? Uh, how, how did you develop that skill? I've always loved the game. I grew up in Kansas. I was a big Kansas Jayhawk fan. And of course, that's that's a lot of where basketball originated with Fog Allen and Dr. James Naismith and, and all that. And so when I was growing up, it was Wilt Chamberlain uh, on uh, the Jayhawks, and I mm-hmm. was such a huge fan. So when um, the sales manager of WLS Radio uh, called me into the office after I got off the air and said, a friend of his worked for the Bulls, and they were looking for a new public address announcer, uh, would I be interested? And I, he said, you do go to basketball games, right? And I said, mm-hmm. oh, my, I go to Bulls games as much as I can. You know, I just love the game. So when I started, it was relatively easy to interpret the uh, signals of the officials because I had been watching the game. I did Mm -hmm. um, study up on it. I got a book of all the different hand signals that the officials flash at the scores table when they do make a call. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's it. I mean, I'm watching the game. I'm intent. I kept my own stat sheet of fouls and technical fouls and team fouls and uh, warnings and things like that. So I was able to just rely on my stats. And then, of course, I sat right next to the official score mm-hmm. and he and I helped each other. If I missed a call or if he missed a call, I, would, I was always, we were always there working together. Yeah. And so how do you think, uh, has it evolved to that process um, where is there anything, I guess, newer? I mean, is it all human element that has to detect what's going on in the game? And I mean, is there any like display screens or anything that help you or, or did recently or anything like that? Did, did it ever get easier? Um, it got easier with um, the uh, ability to actually get a good view of the court. My biggest problem in the last three or four years, or maybe even before that, was players would stand in front of me and I couldn't see around them. <laughs> and, uh, and usually they were six and a half feet tall or seven feet tall. And right. Uh, so they did. Uh, I they did put a small uh, monitor in front of me so I could uh, see what other people were seeing. <laughs> but uh, to answer your question. The, there are all kinds of new innovations going on in the league right now, and there's more to come. Uh, the mm-hmm. one thing that was entered, uh, introduced this year was the ability of coaches to challenge yes. a call. Uh, so they have uh, a button on either side of the scores table, and it sets up a green light. And when he, uh, he or she hits the button, then the officials know that they've been challenged, and so the next dead ball will be reviewed. Uh, the replay center is also monitoring the games, and if they see something that the um, on-court officials missed, for example, a three-pointer should have actually been a two-pointer because a foot was on the line or something like mm-hmm. that, then they can and they can um, overrule and um, adjust the score. Um, but the way that goes through, there's what is called an associate sitting down at the end of the table, and he's listening to the replay center in headphones. And uh, if they do make a change, then he has a little form that he fills out very quickly and he hands it down to the uh, public address announcer and the PA announcer announces it. And at that point, scores, official scores and people handling the scoreboard and all that can make the adjustments. At that point, they have to wait for the PA guy to, to announce it. So, the, you know, that's new this year. And there's also some new innovations that have been tested uh, in the summer league. For example, um, having the rim 
of the basket um, with a sensor that if a ball touches it, especially within the last two minutes of a game, mm-hmm. um, sometimes the um, 24 second shot clock operator is in a position where he can't get a perfect view of the rim in those critical times. So the rim, I think, will eventually become uh, have a sensor to it that if the ball touches it, it automatically resets the shot clock. And uh, yeah, and and I'm sure that's difficult because you have to sense a ball rather than someone actually physically touching the rim. So that's yeah, probably that's true. The technical and challenge. And, the, and I think there's one one more uh, innovation that I think they're working on. They'd like to be able to get it. Um, I'd like to be able to get it uh, to work. Uh, and that is, and that, and that could have had, uh, that could have had some significance on something that happened recently when James Harden slam dunked a ball so violently that it came down and then came back up and came off the rim. <laughs> uh, they have to, they want to have sensors in the actual net that sense huh. when the ball, um, does pass through the rim more than halfway, then that is a made field goal. And sometimes that may be caught and uh, missed by officials. Right. That. So that's, I mean, it's an, they just, the key is that NBA wants to get things right. So yeah. they're using all kinds of technologies to do that. Now, why do you feel that that green challenge light is not being used enough? Like, I, I know these coaches have these challenges and there are situations in games, even like the Bulls game last night, where... Something could have been, I mean, I think it was Wendell Carter fouled out of the game. Uh, it could have been two nights ago, but uh, on, a, on a clearly non-foul. So why do you think they're putting that green light in their pocket and not, and not going through with those challenges? Uh, you know, I think that the coaches, they only have 30 seconds to do that, by the way. Oh. And uh, sometimes they're so upset that uh, – they're wasting time arguing instead of going over <laughs> button. And also um, there have been, I think, what was it? I read, I, somebody told me, or I read someplace that 40% of the challenge calls have been overturned. So 60% uh, were not overturned, but a significant number of 40% were overturned. Uh, and I think that's because the coach knows that it was so, obvious that the that the call was wrong or it could be interpreted in two ways or so so mm-hmm. again everybody's trying to get this thing right because it there's so much at stake on this not only for the teams winning and losing but players want to make sure that all of their assists all of their uh, made baskets and all that stuff are recorded because that has to do with the contracts that they sign of how sure how they perform out on the court. And there's one other thing that I, I don't think that I, I mentioned earlier. The league does monitor games, and there's somebody sitting down. Um, he was sitting down to my right, about four positions. When they watch the game and they look at the statistics popping up on their screen, and if they say somebody missed an assist or somebody missed a rebound, they uh, they contact that person and said, make sure you add a rebound for so-and-so or an assist for so-and-so. Because, again, they want to get it right. Everybody wants to get it right, including the players and the coaches and the league itself. Yeah, and it's just the game is so fast now that it's it's – <laughs> it's difficult to make sure that those you know statistics are accurate and exactly he's exactly doing that and so um what's your opinion on how this league is changing in the direction of the three point shot I, I think there was an interesting statistic in the bulls game last night and uh i think it happened at once prior with the franchise in 2018 where there were more three point shots than two point shots uh huh. What's your What's your impression of that trend and how that's going? I mean, uh, so uh, sometimes I feel like we would just be better suited just taking it to the rim every time because everybody's so spaced on defense. I and mean, what's What's your overall take on on just the trend well, and and where that's going? I'm happy that the three point shot was in, uh, added mm-hmm. to the game because when I started, there was a player on the Bulls team by the name of Jack Marin. 
uh, who could just step on the court right in front of me and shoot the ball and make it. And I mean, it was like, wow. I mean, he was so talented. And at that time, there was no such thing as a three-point shot. So, yeah, and that's, you know, that's the world basketball. Everybody's doing that now. So it's important that the NBA does it. Um, But, uh, you know, that's that's a a coaching decision. And um, they're the ones who decide uh, the plays that are going to be set up to enable people to shoot outside shots, try to uh, space the floor out a little bit more. Players are, um, there are certain players who are exceptionally good at uh, three-point shooting and others who are noticeably not so good. And <laughs> they, uh, they, of course, are more encouraged to uh, go to the rim or at least get in the paint. Yeah. And so um, how, how, now that you're retired and you're just simply a Bulls fan like the rest of us, um, what, um, what do you think of this team right now in terms of, I mean, they came out of the gate saying that they were going to be in the playoffs and uh, the package that's been delivered thus far, though there are spurts of, you know, brilliancy in terms of this young core team. Um, sometimes they just, they just can't close it out. What do you think um, in terms of this year uh, is, is your impression of the team and where do you think they're going to go? They, uh, they're very young for the most part. I mean, there's a couple mm-hmm. of vets in there with Otto Porter and Thad Young, mm-hmm. but they're, they're a very young team. And uh, I just think that they're still learning how to play together. I think they're getting there. I mean, I think Boylan, uh, head coach Jim Boylan said, in a post game thing just the other day that uh, he feels that they're like one basket away, one assist away, one rebound away, one, um, you know, a t- a less turnover away. And that's what's happening. I mean, the most recently mm-hmm. they just lost by one point and they were going to have the last second shot that, uh, that one of the players who was a very good player um, missed. Hey, you can miss shots. I mean, that's all right. part of the deal. But I think they're getting there, and I have the utmost respect for John Paxson, um, uh, who certainly is, you know, uh, 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 he's drafted extremely well. We've got talent that we've drafted over the years. And uh, so, I, you know, I think the Bulls will be back. They just aren't ready to come back yet. Now, I'm sure you've seen this fan sentiment, maybe on social media and such, where people aren't necessarily fans of John Paxson or Gar Foreman and, and sometimes calling for their firing. Do you think that's maybe some miseducation on the part of the fan? Or, I mean, what, what do you say to something like that when you, when you see that? Well, I, 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 yeah, I obviously don't agree with uh, the criticism of John because, you know, you look at the people that he's had drafted, especially in the seventh position. I mean, you know, Kobe White was in the seventh position and uh, some of the other great players that we've had on the team who are actually in that seventh position. They didn't, mm-hmm. you know, we, we got the first guy when we got uh, D. Rose. Right. We got the third guy when we got Michael. So, um no, I, you know, I think that uh, it's just part of the game. Uh, people are going to criticize the coach or the or the general managers and all that stuff. You know, that that's their right. They're they're the fans. Uh, I just personally think that John's doing a great job, and I think that uh, uh, again, it just is taking time for this team to learn how to play together. And and I reference this often, and I will come back to it right now. I have an old tape that I got in the late 80s of the rookie years of Horace Grant and Scottie Pippen playing with Charles Oakley. And I think Dave Corzine was still on the team back then, but uh, where they were barely winning 40 games then with Michael Jordan on the team and Scottie Pippen and everybody else. And uh, it seemed to be during that time frame that until uh until that infamous shot in Cleveland over Craig Elo, um that's that's when it seemed to turn, I guess, for Michael Jordan and the Bulls. They finally got over that hump and then that finally led to them defeating Detroit and, you know, then it snowballed from there into the championship year. So um I agree. I don't know if it's I, I don't know if we have a Michael Jordan on the team at the at this point in terms of that kind of an alpha player. Um, my co-host and I often debate that on that sh- on this show in terms of who is the alpha on the Bulls, but 
I agree. I agree with your sentiments about John Paxson. Um, I think he's done a, an amazing job in terms of drafting guys. Um, maybe not so much in trades. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of some of those trades, like like getting rid of Taj Gibson and such, and uh, some of those things that were done. But I understand why the moves were made. Um, where, I mean, what what do you think we are in terms of this team? Like, are we? A point guard away? Are we, uh, you know, a couple? What, what do you think we're lacking in terms of depth right now? I, uh, I think we're pretty good at the point guard position right now. I think yeah. uh, the shooting guard is there. I think um, I, uh, the guy in the, you know, I think Wendell is going to develop. I, he's just mm-hmm. he's, he's still very young, and he's going up against these very experienced veterans who are a little bit bigger than he is and all that. So, I mean, he's going to continue to put on the muscle there. The training staff is going to make sure that next year he comes back even stronger than this year and all that. Mm-hmm. Lowry uh, has put on so much muscle now and, um, you know, being seven, one, uh, you know, you, I would expect him to play a little bit closer to the rim. Uh, but yeah. other than that, I mean, it, it, again, it's just learning how to to, uh, to play together. Uh, you see the great teams and you see the great players and they know where the other players are and their passing ability is sensational. And mm-hmm. their scoring, uh, of course, is obviously very important. But they see the entire floor. They see the defense. They see the vulnerability of the defense. And they exploit it. So I, I think we just haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, I agree with that. And if I, I and especially that that holds true even in last night's game. So we had Zach Levine driving, missing you know, and obviously Mark Gasol's in front of him, a seven foot huge guy, so it's difficult to see around him. But he had an open Daniel Gafford right at the hoop, and you know, that probably would have changed the course of the game, but that, again, that's court vision and knowing where everybody else is. So I'm I'm totally with you on that. I think – you think they're set for point guard? You think that, that, that Sadoransky's the guy? Oh, uh, no, I think Kobe is. And I think, you think uh, Kobe's going to be the, the point guard of the future? I think I read on Twitter uh, last night that uh, Kobe's probably going to be our point guard. From now on? Well, somebody somebody tweeted last night, and I think it was one of the reporters that cover the game. They said it's obvious that Kobe's going to be moving into the to play the one. So I thought. So I, you know, I can't remember who said that, but uh, when I read it, I went, "Oh, okay, all right." So <laughs> you know, he's he's a kid. He's real young, but look at these kids. Uh, I can't remember um, the Sacramento kid last year i mean he was a rookie and he was the fastest go- the guy on the court yeah. and he was just sensational when trey young entered the league look what he did for when know. he was, you know a young man so you know it's possible it, the game is such that the young guys can excel if they've got the talent the will and the backing of the coaches and everything so let's let him spread his wings and see what he can do i really like kobe white he's i think he's been such a surprise for bulls fans because traditionally you don't see a Bulls rookie that will just chuck up a shot anywhere. And Mm -hmm. especially when he makes most of them that he throws up there. I think that that's uh, an unexpected surprise for Bulls fans. Plus he's such a character, you know? Yeah. He's, yeah, he's a great kid too. Uh, But you know, there again, it gets into confidence and we, you were talking about that a little while ago when, uh, Mm -hmm when you were saying that there's people shooting up threes and nothing's falling and all that, well, that can obviously yeah. really damage your confidence. You've got to make those shots. And once you do like the Jordan over Elo, you know, it just is a, not only a game changer, but a season changer and a whole future changer for, for the, uh, a team. So, you know, I think that's going to happen with the bulls. It just may not happen this season, but I, you know, I'm still a big fan. I, I've got a lot of, uh, good feelings about this team and and i assume that you're you're pretty high on jim boylan as the coach of the team right now uh anybody who studies under popovich has got to be a pretty darn good coach and when 
when Popovich uh, has these guys and just the stories I've heard about how Popovich treats his uh, assistant coaches and uh, just some of the things that happened away from the gymnasium, it just, it just means to me like what a, what a unique and extremely talented individual Greg Popovich is. So if you study under Popovich, like several other of the very assistant coach, uh, very successful coaches, Budenhauser and Milwaukee and more, you can see that uh, they've studied under the, the best. And, and Boylan was there. And I remember him as an assistant coach under uh, Hoiberg. And I thought that he, I think he was more of uh, t- talking about defensive uh, strategy mm-hmm. under uh, Hoiberg. And the way he was doing it and talking to the players and, and coaching them uh, during a timeout before they could sit down and, and uh, drink some water, hydrate a little bit, and hear what the next thing is from Hoiberg. He was out there coaching somebody about where their feet were or how they you know, get around somebody. And I, I used to think, he's a coach. You can tell he is a coach. And so why do you think he has such disconnect with fans? He, I mean, I, I assume you've heard some of these press conferences that he's done. I mean, some sure. of the things he says is just kind of goofy. Like, we don't coach effort or uh, we're trying to develop the bench when, when all of the starters are sitting out when the game's on the line. Um, is he just trying to coach for the team and not for the fan? I mean, that's that's what I don't. That's the one thing about about him that I don't understand. I don't. I, I think other coaches maybe have been more uh, politically correct in their press conference answers, and I maybe think that that's that's might be why there's confusion in the fan base. But um, do you think he's just trying to be a normal guy? <laughs> I mean, where, where does that come from? It, it's unlike anything I've seen in terms of a Bulls coach. Well, I. I can understand what you're saying. Um, yeah. Every time there is a press conference after a Bulls home game, mm-hmm. uh, I'm usually sitting at a table about nine to ten feet away from that podium. Yeah, and uh, they don't have the camera on us; it's just uh, on right. uh, on coach and some of the reporters. But um, I've gone through quite a few of those coaches, from Vinny Del Negro to Tom Thibodeau to mm-hmm. you know just a whole bunch of them. And they all basically say the same thing. They, they um, defend the players. They defend, I mean, Thibodeau was, was terrific at that. If somebody would say, I, I couldn't believe that um, um, so-and-so um, um, took the shot instead of seeing the open man. And, and, and Thibodeau would defend him. And he would mm-hmm. say, look, he, you know, he's a professional. He's out there and... Uh, He's made that shot so many times before. Everybody in the arena should have accepted the fact that he was probably going to make that one, even though he missed. Shots right. do get missed on occasion. So, I mean, he would never criticize a player to the press. It was always building everyone up. And Boylan does the same thing. Um, watching the game, I could see perhaps a good cause for him to criticize a decision made by one of the players or so. And he doesn't like to do that. He doesn't want to do that in public. He doesn't want to do it in a press conference. He does it privately with the player. And I've seen him do that yeah. where there's a timeout. And instead of him meeting with the other assistant coaches out at uh, the free throw lane or out in the paint and let the players hydrate a little bit, he'll go up to that particular player and talk to them and, and coach them. And that's exactly what a coach is supposed to do. And so um, it, it's up to the player whether he uh, takes the uh, suggestions or the training or the education, if he does it or not. But Boylan's trying. He's trying awfully hard. Yeah. And I hope he has success. I really do. I mean, we, you know, we're all diehard Bulls fans and we want the team to succeed. It's just uh, sometimes it seems when we're in a funk like this, it, it turns into more of a soap opera than it does, you know, the team that we're, we're all striving to see win and in rooting for and and Mm -hmm. such you brought up uh tom thibodeau what can you share any stories of the 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 tibbs years in terms of um anything 
stand out specifically in terms of uh, his tenure here uh, with you in terms of any kind of funny story or any instance that happened? Because I, I frankly miss the guy. I, I really do miss him as a coach. I thought he was just a, a dynamic person that was just hilarious to watch and uh, interesting to hear yelling throughout the entire game, even yeah. when you're at home was watching the broadcast. Yeah, he he yelled. He he rarely, very rarely ever sat down. There yeah. are coaches that stand a lot, like Boylan. There's coaches, <coughs> uh, Budenhauser stands a lot too. Um, whereas um, Popovich sits a lot, and uh, Steve Kerr sits a lot. Yeah. So, um, but but Tibbs was <laughs> he was out there, and the thing I remember so well is he would stand where. Um, Joe, the 24 second shot clock operator, Chris, mm-hmm. the game clock operator, and me, and he would stand in front of us, and we, and he was <laughs> not only, well, he wasn't all that tall, but he was wide, and you couldn't see around him, and we would have to, you know, we would have to sh- uh, take care of each other. We would say, uh, <laughs> who, who shot that, or who was the foul on, or something like that. So, um, <laughs> but Tibbs was like that, and when he got upset. He would slam his hand down on the table or kick the table. <laughs> and so, you know, it was like, oh, my God. And, he, and mo- monitors would fall over. <laughs> really? Yeah. You just want to so, say, hey, I'm working here. <laughs> yeah, which, you know, Tibbs, come on. Um, <laughs> I can remember um, a funny story with my son and uh, Coach Thibodeau. My son was a uh, ball boy for about nine years. And mm-hmm. my son loves the game as much as I do. And if that's possible, I mean, maybe even more because he's just a, a great basketball fan. Anyway, so he was a ball boy. And after all of the um, necessary work had, was done in the locker room, the laundry of all the towels, the uniforms, the folding of this and that, putting everything away and cleaning things up and all this stuff, um, each team usually had food from uh, a particular restaurant. Uh, mm-hmm. I know that uh, one of the most famous uh, or, or one of the most popular food items that were brought in for visiting teams were Giordano's pizzas. And oh, they would be, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the coach would say, okay, uh, if we're going to be in Chicago, uh, post-game dinner will be Giordano's pizzas. And, of course, after the game, the players were all lined up taking off slices of pizza and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but anyway, so back on the story. Um, so my son was finished. And uh, there was plenty of food left over. The players were all gone. So my son went over and, and pulled out a plate and started loading up with food <laughs> and went over to a table and sat down. And he had a, a Laker game on up on the monitor. And so uh, next thing he knows, Tibbs walks in, gets a plate, goes over and gets some food. And my son's going, oh, my gosh, I hope he doesn't get upset that I'm sitting here eating. <laughs> and Tibbs sits down at the table. This is a true story. Yeah. So it's at the end of the game. And uh, there's a timeout. Now, Kobe, this is back in the days when Kobe was playing. And so um, somebody said, uh, oh, so there was a last second shot that has to be set up, like two or three seconds left to go in the game. And Tibbs out loud just says, okay, I think the ball's going to come in to uh, Bryant. And he's going to uh, do a real quick uh, step, and he's going to shoot her, shoot about a 20-footer. And my son says, I don't think so, coach. <laughs> <laughs> Tibbs looks at him and goes, what? And my son said, I, I don't think so. I think the ball's going to come into so-and-so, and I think uh, Kobe's going to come off a screen on the side and take the shot there. I think it's a, it's a better shot for him. And Tibbs said, well, we'll find out. So they watched it, and it happened exactly the way my son said. Yeah. And Tibbs looks at him and goes, nice call, kid. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, he, he was generous to my son and all that stuff. But my, when my son told me that, and we were in, my wife and I were out in the car waiting for him to come out. And so when he comes out and tells us that story, we burst in laughing. We think, oh, my God, you're telling Thibodeau he's wrong? Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> well, when it comes down to it, we're all just fans of the game, right? Exactly. I mean, exactly. that's what it is. That's the beautiful thing about it. I mean, I have myself been in 
involved in podcasts and things that revolved around music and technology and software. But the second that I started a Chicago Bulls podcast and a sports podcast, boy, did my audience interactions increase probably tenfold because everybody has an opinion. Right. Oh, yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. That, that's the way it should be. I mean, that's part of being a fan. And um, <clears throat> the, the, the people that I know, the, the people that I would see in the stands, they would be season ticket holders and all that. And they range from uh, every age, every ethnicity, both genders. I mean, they're just fans of the game and the fans of the Bulls. And they've got something they've got to gripe about. Like, they don't like this. They don't like that. They don't like that substitution. They don't like the number of minutes that that person sits on the bench and all this stuff. But that's all part of being a fan of the game. And, um, you know, you've got to, you, you know, it's and fun to get together and, and share stories about stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I've had so much you know, it, it, we've, we've now done this show now for two years and it's, it's amazing. I mean, in the off season, I just, I get this withdrawal. I'm sure you had the same thing, right? Where you're just like, I can't wait. I can't wait for October. I can't wait for the season to start. I can't wait to get in. I mean, maybe now you don't have this, but. <laughs> no, I do. I, mean, I, I do. Because yeah? uh, there, there was a lot of preseason things that I got involved with. I mean, I, um, I did a couple of um, unusual things like this preseason, for example, um, Thomas Rhett, who is a country and Western singer, mm -hmm. uh, who is a superstar, um, who was going to play at the Chicago, at the United Center in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And the word got out that he was a huge Bulls fan. And so we, uh, the United Center called me and said, uh, would you do an intro uh, for Thomas Red, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to invite him into the Bulls locker room. And when uh, he walks in, we'd like to play you doing a Bulls type intro of <laughs> Thomas Red. And I said, yeah. sure, sure. I said, no problem. So I found a recording studio and I recorded it and, and emailed it in. And uh, they put it with the music and all that. So what happened was when Thomas Rhett was getting ready to, uh, he just went and do a sound check the day before uh, the concert. They said, would you like to see the Bulls locker room? And he goes, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. So they take him down in the tunnel and they take him into the locker room. And as the door opens, you hear, dun, 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 mm -hmm. dun. and now, ladies and gentlemen, country and Western superstar Thomas Rhett. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So he's going, oh, and he's looking up at the monitor. He's going, hey, cool, cool. And then they hand him his own Bulls jersey with his name on the back. And he yeah. think, you know, he's freaking out on that. And he's standing there and he's looking. And this was all videoed. I mean, they, they shot it mm -hmm. on video. And they said, uh, he said, I'm standing where Michael Jordan stood. Is this where his locker was? And he said, yeah. <laughs> Who am I? You know, and he's like a little boy. He's just going crazy that he's in the Bulls locker room standing at Michael Jordan's locker in front of what was Michael Jordan's locker. And he's got a Bulls jersey with his name on the back. And he's got the Bulls intro with uh, his name in it. So, I mean, it, that was a fun thing to do. Yeah. Suddenly you turn into a 10 year old kid again when you're yeah, in that experience. Right. And a lot, of the time, a lot of the times preseason, I would go in early and I would record a lot of the pregame announcements that are uh, static. I mean, they're, they're the same announcements about the security and, um, sure you know, the different sponsorships and things like that. So I would get all of those pre-recorded that would save my voice during the season. So, Hmm. I did not know that. So all of those in those spots were all just played <laughs> from recording. Yeah. A lot, a lot of them, not all a lot because there were new sponsors coming in, new promotions coming in that yeah. uh, they would say, okay, the Tommy, these need to be done live. And I'd say, okay, fine. So, you know, that, uh, um, the, the, the job involved, um, I would go in and do rehearsal, uh, uh three hours before tip off, I'd go into do rehearsal and we would rehearse some of the, some of the events who were going out on the floor during the timeouts and halftime and things like that and make sure everybody knew what they needed. Cause there were so, there's so many people involved with Bulls game entertainment, you know, from the lovables yeah. to the Bulls kids, to the Incredibles, to you know, Benny the Bull and all this. So we would rehearse these different things and we would do that three hours before tip and then have dinner. 
and then come out and be ready for the pregame reads. But m- most of those would be re- pre-recorded during just before preseason, sometimes mm-hmm. after the preseason games, because there were still promotions and, and sponsorships still being developed and they needed to be written. And then I would, I would record them. And then, so I, when I did that, it actually saved my voice a little bit. So I didn't have to do as much announcing. And then I would have to do the live inserts. And then we got down closer to the uh, history video and, um, and what they called angels and demons and all that stuff of the different songs that we would be playing mm-hmm prior to me welcoming the crowd and introducing the uh, national anthem. And then we would go into the visiting starting lineup, and then we'd go into what we call running of the Bulls, which is Mm -hmm. the uh, intro for the Chicago Bulls. What did you ever get anybody, any players or anything that just said, Hey, Tommy, I want you to say my name like this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I did. Really? Oh Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, the Celtics were kind of like that too. They, you know, they would say, "Hey, would you say your name? Would you say uh, my name kind of like you do, Michael Jordan?" <laughs> I go, no, no. But but but, I, but I, there was something like, for for example, uh, Pat Beverly, mm-hmm. uh, kid who grew up in Chicago. Yeah, and, uh, I have he, a I have a story to tell you about Pat Beverly and myself in a minute. Sure. So so Pat goes over to Chris. Uh, Wilson, yeah. who is the uh, clock operator, uh, because Chris, um, on, on the uh, his other job is uh, health clubs. He works on health clubs, mm. managing health clubs. And apparently Patrick uh, joined one of the health clubs and Chris, and he became, you know, acquaintances and all this stuff. So he went over to um, Chris and said, hey, do you think uh, you can get Tommy to uh, introduce me from Chicago? <laughs> and uh, Chris said, yeah, let me try. So uh, after he walked away, Chris says, hey, uh, Pat wants to know if you could introduce him from Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I said, my God, that's right. He is from, he's a, he's a Chicago kid. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure I'll do that. So, um, so I introduced him from Chicago. And then the next year when the Clippers came in town, I did it again. And Beverly came down and they gave me a fist bump right after I did it. <laughs> and, nice. Uh, and Doc, uh, Doc came down and, and kind of looked at me and was nodding his head, yeah. Yeah, like that. Because I remember telling an assistant coach for the Clippers that I can remember back when I first started with the Bulls back in 76, 77, all that, Mm -hmm. that uh, people would say, hey, there's Glenn Rivers. There he is. Call him Doc now. And he's I think he's going to go to Marquette because he was still in high school and he would be wearing his letter sweater or letter letter jacket Jacket. and come to a Bulls game. And then uh, Derek. Uh, D Rose uh, came over uh, after he had played for about a year in the pregame. And he said, Hey, can you play that song? I can feel it coming in the air tonight. You yeah. used to do it by the old stadium. And I said, sure. Cause he grew up at the Chicago stadium also. And, yeah. uh, and he would, when I introduced that, uh, I can feel it coming in the air tonight, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's fun when the players do that. So my, I'll tell you my Pat Bev story. This offseason, when he was in free agency and still undecided whether he was going to sign with the Clippers, I tweeted him and said, if you sign with Chicago, I will pay for your gas of your moving truck and drive your moving truck to Chicago. (laughs) And he retweeted it with like bug eyes going, oh, yeah. And what I didn't expect was that there were Clippers fans that looked up my name, found my phone number, started calling me and, you know, just, it got a little bit out of control, yeah, but I still would have done it. I would have done it just for the publicity value, you know, yeah, yeah, that's all, the, all the sports stations as I roll the moving truck into town, you know, passing by. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is that, you know, and you've been aware of this too. Uh, Anthony Davis has said mm-hmm. that uh, Chicago is the Mecca of basketball and, there are so many people, um, you know, uh, underlining that, saying that's true. Chicago is the mecca of basketball. Look at this. Look at the players that come out of Chicago, and look at the players who have idolized Chicago players and want to be like those Chicago players. So it is true. Yeah, yeah. That's and that's the thing is, I, I wish, like, it breaks my heart every time I hear these interviews of, of 
like a couple years ago, Shaq and Kobe were talking and, and, and Kobe's like, yeah, we were going to be in the, I was going to be in the bulls. I already picked out a house in, uh, in Highland park and everything else. Yeah, It's like so many close things. Like even the big three of LeBron and Bosch and uh, D Wade could have happened in Chicago. I don't think a lot of people realize that. That's true. Just, we didn't have enough money to bring Bosch. So that, that put the kibosh on the whole deal. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, LeBron has always been chasing uh, Michael. I think and, he always uh, will, frankly. Yeah. But yeah. And uh, just my I often as wonder a Bulls if fan. he looked up at, uh, up at the, up at the um, banners in the, in the ceiling, the rafters, thinking I, w- I would want my uh, mind right next to Michael or something like that. I've always wondered about that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we as Bulls fans will never get that chance. And uh, it's just... It's interesting to think about what what could have been, right? That's that's the ultimate, I guess, fantasy of a Bulls fan. Is we ha- we have this running fantasy team in our head of what what should have been or could have been, and especially when we see things like Derrick Rose making the winning shot last night yeah. against the Pelicans. I, so, I tell you something. I am so happy for him. I am, oh yeah. I am just thrilled for D Rose. I mean, I remember when he went down, and I remember how his life was just shattered. And and you know, he's a he's a basketball player. I mean, that that's his whole life. That's what his family, his mom, you know, when she would be out there in the in the areas of Inglewood and telling all those gang members, "You leave my son alone. He's yeah. out here and he's shooting baskets until it was too dark to see." I mean, the kid has just worked so hard, and I am so happy for him. Yeah. You think there's a shot he'll ever come back to Chicago? Uh, uh, I just – some people have told me that they hope it doesn't happen, and I'd say, why? And they say, we don't want him hurt again, and we don't don't want it to happen in Chicago. And I'm thinking, oh, God. I'm sure he doesn't either, right? (laughs) No, he doesn't either, but – you know, I'm, I'm I'm just thrilled that he is having such a great. He's had several great seasons now. You know, when he was yeah. with the Wolves, and and but now with the Pistons, and and they're and he's the guy. He's the go-to guy at the end of the game, and it's great. Yeah, I feel the same about Jimmy Butler. Like I look at Jimmy Butler and go, "That's a, now he's got something that he can work with. He's got a team that's actually built around him, and he's finding some pretty good success with it." Yeah, he is. Yeah. He is. And I think that was the D Wade. Um, they, you know, I think that Wade, um, when Wade came to the Bulls, he and Jimmy bonded big time. And uh, when Jimmy was the free agent and everything, I think Dwayne Wade was, you know, he could have been instrumental in, in convincing Jimmy to talk to uh, Pat Riley and and uh, coming down to Mil- uh, Miami. Yeah, and just kind of take the torch. That was a really bizarre year, wasn't it? We had Rondo yeah. that year. And I, I would love to see Rondo be an NBA coach one of these days because I, from from what they say from the different players and and things like that, they all say that he's the best teammate that they've ever had. I believe it, and I can tell you this: that when uh, Rajan was with the Bulls, he would be playing tonight uh, in a Bulls game, and then tomorrow night on his night off, he would be at the Windy City Bulls game, sitting on the bench, coaching some of the young kids. Yeah. That's what kind of a, a basketball player he is. He is he is not only an excellent guard, and, you know, he's got so much history and he's got rings and all that, but I tell you, on his night off, he's at the Windy City Bulls game coaching some of the kids. Yeah. That's what kind of a person he is. I, I think I think we're right then. I think he would be a great coach, and oh, I hope that happens for him someday. Absolutely, no, that's yeah. no, without question. Yeah, and he's so, one of the nice guys in the world too. Yeah. So, what is like we've covered a lot, but I want to know what is the one thing that people may not know about what your job was as the PA announcer? Like, what what has what does no one know about that that you did on a regular basis? <laughs> Oh boy, I don't know. Let's see. I, you know, something I don't know if there is anything because it was always out there. 
I mean, uh, I can tell you that I've made mistakes when I was out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anything major? I mean, well, um, it seems flawless to, to me when I'm when I was at the games or watching on know, on the broadcast. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember the name of the player. His first name was Justin, and I can't even remember what team he was on. Yeah. I want to say it was on Charlotte or maybe Atlanta or something like that. I can't remember his last name. But when he uh, was when he fouled somebody, uh, it was a night that I was really tired. I had done three or four hours on the air on the CBS radio station that day, yeah. and it's just and so I said um, the foul was on Justin Hayward. Yeah, <laughs> and then I looked around and I looked. How many people caught the fact that I just talked about the lead singer of the Moody Blues? Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> and nobody looked at me, and I thought, oh, I, I got away with it. Nobody yeah. noticed. Yeah, but <laughs> that was that was probably one of my major goofs. Yeah. yeah, and then there was that guy last year, TLC, Timote. What's Timote Luwawu Cabarro. Gosh, how did you remember that? Well, I had you know I, that's one of the things I would do before the games. So I would uh, the the press notes usually have a phonetic uh, pronunciation yeah. of players, especially foreign players. And um, so I would sit there and rehearse it. Timote Luwawu Kabaro. Timote Luwawu Kabaro. And over and over and over. So it just became um, natural. (laughs) And then when I would start doing it, people looking at me like, what? (laughs) What's his name? (laughs) And then like at the beginning of the season, this season, I talked to Swirsky, Chuck Swirsky. And know that uh, Sadoransky, a lot of times, is just called Thomas Sadoransky. And mm-hmm. we looked at each other, and I said, what do you think, Chuck? And he said, I want to call him Tomas. That's his name. I said, exactly. Yeah. Um, then there's, um, oh, my God, let me see. What's, what's, um, help me out here. He was a center. Uh, he went to the Houston Rockets from the Bulls because they offered him an enormous contract. Oh. And he came back and finished his career with the Bulls. He got oh, sick. Oh, that's uh, the Turkish hammer, uh, Amir uh, Sikh. Huh? Right? Yeah, Yash. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. What's the first name? Amir. No. Oh, it's not a Sikh. No, no. See that here's that that's part of the story. But I I got oh. the last name. <laughs> His first name is Omer. That's it. Omer. Yeah. When he first joined the Bulls, I went down and I said, "Hey, Omer, how do you pronounce your last name?" He said, "Ashik." I said, "Ashik." Ashik. He said, yeah. I said, Omer, Omer Ashik? Yeah, okay, fine. So then I went into the press room, and I ran into Stacy King. Yeah. And I said, uh, I was just talking to Omer Ashik. He said, no, we're going to call him Ashik. <laughs> I, I said, but that's not his name. <laughs> they said, yeah, it is. I went, no, it's not. <laughs> so anyway, so, um, so the first game, Omer checks in, and I say, checking in for the Bulls, Omer Ashik. Well, uh, Kevin Harlan was doing the game across mm-hmm. from me. And he looked, I, I remember looking over at him, he looked at me like, what? And so he had his guy come over during a timeout and said, how did you pronounce Omer's name? I said, <laughs> Omer pronounces his name, Omer Ashik. And he said, that's his name. And so they went, oh, okay. So he went back and told Harlan and Harlan started calling him Omer Ashik. Because Omer, he was calling him a sheik. Yeah, okay? as I do. So then, yeah. So then, um, I'm watching a PTI, and I see Tony Kornheiser and um, Mike Wilbon refer to him as Omer Ashik, and no, Omer Ashik. And so I tweeted them, and I said his last name is Ashik, not Ashik. Well, they kept calling him a sheik until he left the Bulls, went to Houston. Houston said his name is Omer Ashik, not Omer Ashik. Yeah. And so everybody started getting it right at that point. But that used to bug the heck out of me. How they, you guys decide, you guys decide his name is Ashik? <laughs> Why didn't you ask him what his name was? His name is Omer Ashik. And the thing about Omer is he's so bashful. He's so shy. Yeah. That he was like, I, I don't care what you call me. You know, I, I really don't care. It doesn't bother me and all that. I said, but Omer, your name's Ashik. Yeah. Ashik. It's not Ashik. <laughs> it's, it's Ashik. 
He said, yeah, I know, I know, but I don't care when they call me a sheik. I went, okay, fine. So, yeah, I feel so bad for him too. The way that he had to stop just be, yeah. with his, uh, I think it was an arthritic condition that he had or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was getting to him too. It's too bad. And like I said, he was, he's really a wonderful guy. And sometimes when he'd be playing, I'd say, I'd think to myself, he is such a, a kind individual. He needs to toughen up out there. <laughs> He yeah. needs to be a, not a nice guy out there because he he could be dominating because he was so big. I feel the same way about Felicio on our team, and he gets a bad rap. And he, even you know, I'm very critical of him a lot. I I just think you know, and and I've been, we've had other people on this podcast that has had experiences with him, and even like been at his table at the Bulls charity events and things like that. That he's just, um super sweet guy really nice yeah. yeah everybody everybody likes him but like lacks that i don't know it seems like he lacks that kind of killer uh instinct a little bit i mean yeah yeah he's know, a, i'm not he's a seven footer but if i was I, I think i'd be hitting the hitting the boards a lot harder yeah he he uh he's seen as a great teammate everybody likes him on the team he's a great teammate yeah yeah, I know, but I'm, I want him to be a great player <laughs> as yeah, a fan. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. And yeah, I he think has, he had it the first year that he was up with us. And I just, I don't know. It just seems to, it's strange how s- some players just kind of lose that ability over time as their career goes. And I don't know if that's due to injury. I know he's had a lot lately, but um, it really would be nice to have a a, a good, aggressive, dominant center. And then, I preach on this podcast all the time that the bull, the current bulls, we need an Ed Neely on this team. We need, and I was hoping Gafford would be that guy. And he's seen, you know, he, there's flashes of that lately. Oh, I think he's, he, I think, I think uh, Gafford is going to develop into an outstanding basketball player in the NBA. He's got the skills, but more importantly, he's got the desire. You can tell that he wants it badly and yeah. and he he's only a rookie so that means this next uh, off season uh the trainers are going to have him building up his um, his mm-hmm. upper body and all that and going to be working on different things to make him even better but i'll tell you something i am so impressed with gafford what a great steal in the second round i agree and i really like his character too I, mm-hmm. uh, he seems like a very humble guy and a guy that's really willing to put in the work. And that's, the, that's the kind of character that I know John Paxson and the the rest of the management in terms of the, the front office of the bulls, that's the kind of thing that they strive for. And, you know, I'll say this, the fans can, can complain all they want about how, you know, John Paxson and Gar Foreman, um, you know, what, what we do in terms of the, the roster on this team. But the one thing is, Everybody on this roster is of high character, uh-huh. right? and you and can Gafford. tell that by how they carry themselves before and after the games. That that is one of the uh, primary um, traits of players that John Paxson drafts. Mm-hmm. He likes four year college players um, only because of the maturity coming out of school. But yeah, when you that's a get, rare bird these days, though. Somebody right. that goes four years. But when you get uh, a kid coming out like uh, Kobe, I mean, you got to grab him because he is uh, part of your future. Gafford's got a chip on his shoulders, and and, and I mean that very positively. Mm-hmm. He's out there, second round. Oh yeah, I'm going to be playing with the first rounders. You know, so I I really am a big fan of. Uh, Dan yeah, Gafford. I think Gafford's got a lot of Taj Gibson in him. Yeah. You know, yeah, Gibson I, was exactly the same way. You're right. Gibson, I'll never forget the Dwayne Wade breakaway slam dunk that Todd Gibson blocked. Yeah. And <laughs> to me, you know, I, I came out of my seat on that one. I, I was just so impressed. Uh, wow. So, yeah, there's been those flashes and those moments as Bulls fans that, that tug on our heartstrings and keep us back. You know, every every time I see somebody – on Twitter or something like that going, I gave up on the bulls. I'm done. Yeah. Well, next game, you're still tweeting about them. It's a love hate <laughs> relationship. That'll never go away. As long as yeah. you're, 
as long as you bleed bulls red, I don't think that that can ever go away. Mm -hmm. Well, Tommy, I want to thank you so much. Uh, you, you've been very gracious with your time and I, I wish you nothing but the best in retirement. Uh, if you ever want to come back on and talk bulls again during the season or wherever it happens to be, you can consider this maybe your, your online podcast home as far as uh, <laughs> okay. anywhere yeah, to, I'll make to sure vent. I, I keep, I'll keep your contact information. Thank you so much. And uh, again, um, you know, you, you're a legend in Chicago, not only for what you've done in radio. And quite frankly, I think that you've shaped a lot of the media in Chicago in terms of how, you know, how the, how music programming is done in Chicago. Um, I was a recipient of that in terms of a listener where uh, stations that you programmed would play a rock track, a pop track, a hip, you know, a rap track and all of that all within the same hour. And it was so unusual and uh, yet, you know, still helped to shape and, and develop the framework of what Chicago radio is today. So mm, thank, thank you, you for that. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your years of service as a Bulls public address announcer. Um, I've probably attended, I don't know, a couple hundred games uh, over the years. And it was always a pleasure mm -hmm to you know see you and hear you during the games and especially when those pivotal moments and those great you know great shots that would happen over the years so I want to thank you for your service and not only as a radio guy but to the Bulls itself you've been a, a legend I hope we see you in the Hall of Fame somewhere down the road in terms of NBA and things and uh, like I said anytime you want to come on and talk Bulls the invitation is wide open for you thank you Marcus thank you all right. Thanks, Tommy. Have a great day and uh, en enjoy California. All right. Thanks. All right. Take bye, care. Bye-bye. Wow, Wise, that was pretty insightful. I mean, what did you get out of that interview with Tommy Edwards? Man, dude, like, <laughs> that was... But he dropped some nuggets on me that I, I literally didn't know. Like, just him, like, being a former PA announcer and given his entire tenure with the Bulls, how long he's been around the organization, man. Like, just uh, dropping a few stories on us about, like, some of the, uh, the players of the past and even, you know, giving some insightful nuggets about what it takes to even be a PA announcer, man. I, I thought that, that was uh, that was very valuable for people who may even, you know, can may consider that as a career down yeah. the line or something like that. You know, I thought it was awesome. But really... How about the Pat Bev story? I want to be introduced as Pat Bev from Chicago. <laughs> yeah, that one as well. That one as well. Like, seeing that he uh, kind of built the rapport with Pat Bev, you know, getting uh, some dap from him and all that. That That's super cool, man. I mean... Yeah. It just, it just goes to show you how how prideful us Chicagoans are. You know, it never leaves you, right? Like Pat Bev wanting to be introduced, although he's playing for the Clippers at the mm -hmm. time, although he was playing for another team, he wanted to be introduced, letting everyone know that he was from the city of Chicago. So, I mean, that, that just speaks volumes to what the city of Chicago is about in terms of basketball. I can't believe, first off, that they had to put a monitor up on the scores table because Tibbs was so wide and standing right in the middle of the court. <laughs> that was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. I, I, sure. I'm Obviously, you could tell I was stunned when Tommy said that uh, it was going to be Kobe White as the point guard of the Bulls for the future. You were stunned by that? I, I was kind of. I, I don't so know you, if he's a true so point guard. So do you disagree? I don't disagree, but, me, you know, the guy knows something I don't. Obviously, he's there. You know, I'm not there. I see what's on television. I don't see anything else. Now, I think yeah. it, I think he's just looking at it from a fan's perspective like we are too, though. Because when I, like, I kind of agree with him. You know, just because I, I don't think if the Bulls uh, even get like the number one pick next season or something like that, I don't think they're going to go for a point guard unless it's just a guy who just blows us out of the water, oh, like yeah. similar to Derrick Rose or something like that. But I think we're all like we've seen a, a OK, fairly, a fairly OK sample size from Kobe just in terms of his glimpse. Like you, you, you like see that he's shown glimpses of being a very special player. 
the way yeah. that he can take over a game and all that. So I think it's a thing where Tommy just sees that Kobe has some developing to do. You know, he's only a 19 year old kid, so you know he still has a lot of time. So that I, I agree, he could be the Bulls' point guard of the future. One more thing yeah. that stood out to me was uh, going back to the Tom Thibodeau story, uh, yeah. where he was talking about his son mm -hmm. when, when he yeah. and his son. Uh, I think Kobe. it was. Yes, with Kobe, where his uh, son TV, actually yeah. got the play right, where yep. uh, Thibodeau basically, <laughs> basically like he had to fess up that he was wrong about that play, and he had to give some kudos to Tommy's son. That was definitely yeah. uh, a, a really cool story to me. And it was cool to know that that kind of stuff happens. It's oh just yeah, like, uh, it's just like going to work anywhere else, man. You're just hanging out at the break room. Sometimes the boss comes in and sits down, right? kind of fun yeah. it's, it's super cool to hear how like you know down to earth it sounds like Thibodeau is you know yeah. in, instead of you know being a butthole or something like that you know and, and like yeah. maybe trying to say as to oh, oh you got lucky with that when he actually gave the kid his props no, I, I think he just yells uh, at players I think he's nice to everybody else anyway <laughs> awesome yeah it was that was a major coup in terms of that interview uh, it is one of those things to where it just comes down to asking. And all I did was ask Tommy, and he graciously said yes and spent some time and, and got it in. So uh, we are eternally grateful to Mr. Tommy Edwards for not only his service with the Bulls, but his service with the Bulls podcast. And on that, uh, everybody, I'm going to wish you a uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all the rest of it. We are going to be back in the new year with episode number 51. And we got some really cool surprises coming up, even just in the first month of 2020. No, for sure. All right, man. I hope you guys are looking forward to it as much as I am. And Thank you again to Tommy Edwards for coming on to our show, man. It was definitely a blessing, and you're always welcome back. I would love for you to come back on uh, a future episode where I'm available to, to discuss some bulls with you as well. But, uh, yeah, man, uh, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas to everybody. All right. Until next time, thanks for listening, everybody. Go Bulls. Go Bulls. Hey, Bulls fans. This is your Bulls championship announcer, Ray Clay, saying so long, everybody. Go Bulls!